Well, I want to, if, if you want a title for my message, it's How Then Shall We Live? That's been the title of my message for the last four years. So it won't be the same message, but that's really the essence of it. How then shall we live? And if you think about that, it could be a question. How then shall we live? Or it could be a unified decision regarding a choice. How then shall we live together and press on? And I want to speak about a crowd, you know. We're a part of a crowd here at Global Connections. And uh, one of my memories that's great is when Pastor Al Houghton, you remember Pastor Al Houghton was here amongst us? And he said on that morning, I'm from God, I'm going to visit this people and I'm going to activate the heart of David. I mean, we'd have to have noticed really how our worship, our praise and worship has just opened up and expanded. And obviously two factors of David's life was he was a worshipper and he was a warrior. And so we've had plenty of things too to stand in the gap and fight through. But God's been visiting us, I believe, well and truly. So crowds are very, very important. And for myself as a young fella, I had an experience at Brisbane Exhibition. Uh, four children in my family and so mum would take us Tuesday afternoon and then my dad would come from work when, uh, Tuesday evening because Wednesday was a holiday and we'd go to the Ecker. And I still remember very, very clearly where we were in this crowd and I don't know if you've ever experienced a crush and the crowd started a crush. It was just van packed and I was only a little guy and my dad got me over against their very high wall, very high concrete wall, got me over against the concrete wall and sat over there with his hands over me to protect me from the crush. Very precious memory in my own mind, but of course now our Heavenly Father really fills in that gap and watches over us and keeps us. So life's a very interesting thing as we journey through it. Mainly it's made up of interaction with other human beings. Have you found that? That's really the essence of life. And uh, I had a haircut last week. You probably haven't noticed, but I had one. And uh, uh, after Joe sharing last Sunday about opportunities to connect with somebody, share about Christ, so I had a young lady who cut my hair. Now, I didn't really get to share Christ with her, but I know a whole lot about her. I know her name, know where she lives, know where she was born, uh, know what her interests are. So I've discovered a whole lot of things because I've got an agenda, because I'm going back. All she's doing is cutting her hair. But there's an agenda really to connect with this young lady in the right manner because I've got a treasure that she doesn't know anything about really and I want to share that treasure with her. Did anybody get a chance to share through the week with anybody at all around the place? Yeah, well, there you go. Hallelujah. That's great, eh? So I want to talk about a crowd, and I'm going right back to Genesis. So um, fasten your seatbelt. We're going from Genesis through Luke to Hebrews by 10.30, maybe. Anyway, Genesis 11, I'm going to read a few verses in there uh, because, what did I say? 10.30, well, just if we look at it, it's only 10.30 now, so we're, we're doing good. It says... It's, <laughs> these glasses aren't good for long sight. <laughs> so uh, in Genesis 11 it says, There was a time when everyone on the earth spoke the same language. As many of these people began moving from the eastern regions into the western part of Mesopotamia, they settled down on a plain in the land of China. Now that's an interesting statement. I, I remember a guy sharing many, many years ago, he was a Christian politician actually, and uh, he'd been in the Air Force and he said to me, well, he didn't say to me, he said it to the group of guys, he said, I've discovered in the Word of God that the Air Force was really the first service that God initiated and it's in the Bible. And he read that passage and said, they found a plane in China and Pontius was the pilot. So, so it's amazing what you can get out of this book. There you go. Anyway, it's nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Since stone was not readily available, they discovered how to make bricks and use tar for mortar to build their structures. And they said to one another, let us make bricks out of mud and bake them in the fire. And let us 
build ourselves a city with a huge tower that reaches into heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. If we don't, we'll risk being scattered all over the earth. Very interesting things, lettuce, and uh, the power that's within lettuce. And there was something significant happening here. These people, they're in agreement, uh, and uh, the thing is they wanted to settle. You know, the first blessing that God ever spoke in this word of God in the Genesis 1 was he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and really replenish the earth. Get over and take over the earth. And that's never changed. And God repeated that later on. He said very, the same thing to Noah. Really, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, but move out into the earth. But these people thought it would be a great idea to settle. Humanity had, set, had multiplied and spread amazingly in this time. And you can read all this. I'm not going to read the scripture. I'll just share what it says. You can read it later if you like. But by the time we get to Genesis 6, their problems had multiplied as well. Population multiplied. Problems had multiplied. And God came to a staggering conclusion when you, when you read that. And this is basically what God said. The first thought of everyone's mind is evil and the constant purpose of every person is evil. And that's a staggering statement really even that early back into creation as we understand it, that God was looking at humanity and saying, that's, that's what I've discovered. And he said, this is the answer to it. I'll wipe out humanity. Incredible for us, isn't it now? as Troy was even sharing about Jesus, his birth, and really what it's meant for us, and now our life and so forth. But got back there, God said, I'll wipe out humanity. Now we say, oh, but he didn't really mean that. Yes, he did mean that. But it says, but. You ever underlined the buts in the Bible? I love the blessed buts. It's amazing what the buts in the Bible precede really as you read them. And it says, but there was one person the Lord could not let go of, and his name was Noah. There was one person. Interesting, God could use just one person. And it says, as you read on in, in Genesis 6, all people on the earth except Noah had lived corrupt lives and ruined God's plan for them. Now that might sound very final, but it doesn't say it ruined God's plan. It says it ruined God's plan for them. Thank God God's plan has never been ruined and it never will be ruined and it's going on and we're a part of it today. So Noah, God said, well, I need to get something happening here. Noah built something and we know what it was called the ark. That could be used very constructively and through one man God could save the human race. What a, a, a very clear picture right back in Genesis 11, right back in the beginning of the book, something constructively could be established and one man God could use to save the human race. Now, of course, we can translate that into the New Testament and say, God knew one man could save the human race and his name is Jesus and he could build something constructively called the church which could be used to save the human race. And that's what we're here for, isn't it? Really, God's used his son to bring us into a place where he can establish the ecclesia, the called out ones, so that we then in turn could be the means of salvation to the human race in Jesus' name. So I think that's pretty exciting, really, that God would involve us in things like that. And he'd looked at humanity, he knows all about them, and he saw the depths of where they'd gotten up to. Okay, so if you remember, it's often been said, you know, the ark was built by an amateur and the Titanic by professionals. The good news is, really, they could find out where the ark settled, really, on Mount Ararat, and they found where the Titanic settled. That was on the bottom of the ocean bed. So it's, it's very interesting. It doesn't matter the qualifications. If God's involved, the outcome is brilliant. The most brilliant can be involved, and the outcome disastrous. So the ark... We know it was there on Ararat, it's been seen back there. So backtracking, first one, let us make bricks, 
Build, that's not a bad outcome. That sounds pretty good. Second, let us, let's build a city with a huge tower that reaches into heaven. And it's, it's funny, I, I mean, I smile. I love this book because it's full of pictures and, and that's really what I see when I read. Really, nothing's changed. Man today is still seeking to get to heaven with spaceships. And Sir Richard Branson, really, he's right up there leading. It's amazing what he's got going and the dollars that he's got going as well because that's the plan is to try. They're going to get up there one way or another. And, of course, you and I know if they talk to us, we could save them all the money and all the time and say it's not going to happen. If you can read in Genesis 28, and I'm not suggesting you go there right now, just on the way through, Jacob was totally on his own. Esau and the situation that happened there, the birthright, uh, there was an upset in the family and Jacob headed off. And he's out on his own now and it's getting towards night and he's looking for somewhere to sleep. And I thought he could have made a better choice, but it says he found a rock and used that for his pillow. Um, that's not really my go at all. But the fact was that when he lay down there, he fell asleep and he had a dream. God-given dreams are amazing. Do you ever have any God-given dreams? They're quite fascinating, aren't they? But I heard a guy, and I may have said this before, called T.L. L. Osborne. Do you remember T.L. Osborne? T.L. and Daisy Osborne. Heard him say, many, many years ago, you'll find power for your hour when you esteem God's dream. Never forgotten that statement. You'll find power for your hour, and I offer my hour, when you esteem God's dream. So when Jacob dreamt, he saw a ladder set up on earth reaching into the heavens. Amazing thing is, when he woke up, he said, God's in this place. This is an absolutely awesome place. This is the house of God. This is the gateway to heaven. See, God's not into using man-made towers. He puts steps on the pathway to heaven and he uses a crowd in his house to help people find the steps to that pathway to heaven because that's what we're about. That's really what our daily lives are about, helping people find the steps so that they can find the God who dwells in the heavens. And the third, let us make a name for ourselves. Unfortunately, people sometimes get caught up in the wrong crowd. And self-importance started very, very early uh, in the crowds, the planet, humanity, and uh, God has had to deal with that ever since, that let us make a name for ourselves. Crowds always carry an influence. You know, we carry an influence. Not, not ego, I'm not talking about being wrapped up in ourselves, but we carry an influence. And when we go out into the world around about us, we want to take the influence of today of being in that attitude of worship, really experiencing the presence of God, and we want to take that out into the world that's round about us and be dispensers of that wonderful presence. So crowds have influence and they carry a presence. And I'm going to touch on uh, Luke, the end of Luke 18. I'm not going to read it. I'll just share it. You can check the story, but I'm sure we pretty well know these stories. On the way through, Luke 18, there's a crowd, another crowd. Wherever Jesus turned up, there was crowds and there was a blind man there. Mark would really say that was Bartimaeus. So there was a blind man and uh, he was in the crowd. He heard what was happening and he heard Jesus was coming that way. And so very, very loudly he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, show mercy on me. And obviously he'd heard of Jesus. He knew what to cry out. He knew who he was crying out to, but he couldn't see him. He was totally blind. And so really being able to see Jesus in that situation was beyond his capacity. And the interesting thing is the crowd in there tell him to be quiet. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to be careful in the crowd that it doesn't stifle the cry that really God's put in your heart. And that needs to come out, needs to rise up, needs to go up to him. And I think that's the wonderful thing about prayer meetings, where really together we can let the cry that's in our heart to God come out in that atmosphere 
and we trust it does touch the heart of God. But this guy only shouts louder as the crowd tries to shut him down. The picture for me that I see in this is the crowd want Jesus all to themselves. You know, sometimes we can inadvertently even be that way. We want, want the focus all to be on me. And uh, there's a song around, not that I listen to it often, but I know it says, what about me? But what about me? What about me? And I think this crowd, they really didn't want Jesus to be looking at somebody else who had a need. They just, but what about me? Look at me. And so Jesus stops, and again, I'm always fascinated the way Jesus operates. He gets the crowd to bring the blind man to him. He uses the very people who have been trying to shut this whole thing down to bring this blind man to himself. And Jesus asks the question, what do you want me to do? Now, obviously, Jesus had looked into a lot of blind eyes. You can go back over Luke or the Gospels, and you'll find really that many received their sight. So Jesus recognized blind eyes when he saw them. It wasn't that he had to be uh, bring understanding as to what, what am I really looking at here. He was looking totally into blind eyes. And, of course, he opened the eyes of the man as he said, I want to come out of this dark world I'm living in and see the light. You know, really, that's, again, what we're about, isn't it? We want to hear the cries of people. I want to come out of this dark world that I'm living in and I want to see the light. You know, Job said something very interesting in chapter 42. He said, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Now, Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus by the hearing of his ear. But when his eyes were open, then he could say, but now I can see who you are. And thank God for eyes opened. And if they're a bit blurry, we can say, Father, get some of that eye salve that you talk about and anoint the eyes of my heart so that I can really see who Jesus is in my life today in this very aspect of today that I'm walking in. So his eyes are opened, and he starts following Jesus, shouting praises to God. This guy wasn't going to be shut down in any way, shape, or form. So he's now shouting to God, and the interesting thing is the crowd hears him shouting, so they join in too, and they're shouting praises to God. Isn't it marvellous, hey, the crowd and the influence, really, what can happen? And we all get involved, and this morning we're all involved in shouting praises to God and singing, O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And man, I love that. I love that we're caught up in that whole thing. So the crowd is involved now, same crowd who previously wanted to shut the guy down, keep him quiet. Luke 19, then Jesus comes into Jericho, and there's another man there, and his name's Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is only a little guy. Now, I'm not tall by any means. This guy was a little guy uh, in stature, but he was big on stealing from people, and he had government backing. No, I shouldn't have said that. Um, but, but it was pretty right anyway, if you know the story. Uh, so he could had to give so much to the Roman government, but then he could keep a whole lot for himself. So you can picture this guy, Zacchaeus, not only short, but really the crowd would have known who he was and what he did as a tax collector. And uh, so really the vibes would have been going out in all sorts of ways towards this guy. But he said, I can't see Jesus for the crowd. Man, my heart, I was just reading through this saying, God, I never, ever want to be in any crowd that hinders anybody from seeing Jesus. And I'm sure you don't want to either. That any way through our manner or words or actions or whatever we do, that someone who's seeking to see Jesus, that we could be a means of blocking their view. So Zacchaeus came up with a brilliant plan. I'll get up a tree and uh, I'll wait for Jesus to come through. Again, it staggers me wonderfully that Jesus walked under the exact tree that Zacchaeus was up in there, and he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, there's not a house in town that I'd rather be at today. Now, that was wonderful. Zacchaeus shimmied down that tree, thrilled to bits, excited. Man, couldn't believe how good this has been. and what do you think the crowd were doing? Complaining. Jesus has gone home with a notorious sinner. How many of you 
would love to have that sort of testimony to walk out of here with today. Jesus has gone home with a notorious sinner today. Man, I mean, I would be thrilled to be, I don't know about you. Now, I'm not picking on notorious sinners, sin, sin, no matter what category it's in. But that was the concern of the crowd, isn't it? Jesus can't know what's going on. He's going home with the wrong people. And the other side of that, really, they were murmuring because they were saying, he's not doing it the way that we think he should. That can happen in crowds too, even in churches. Not going the way that I think it should. We've got to be careful we guard our hearts, eh? Because Jesus all the time is reading our heart and wanting to really minister to our lives. So the situation with Zacchaeus, the crowd caught up in that, and Jesus going home. And the interesting thing you know about Zacchaeus, about his name, and again that's what fascinates me with this book, his name comes from a derivative which really means to do good. Now the guy wasn't doing any good. He was stealing from people right, left and centre. But the good thing is that God knew when Jesus touched Zacchaeus' life that the man that he was meant to be would start to live the life he was meant to live. Isn't that something, hey, when God comes into our life, he knows my name, Psalm 139, you've only got to read that, where David speaks about really... You, you knew me from my mother's warm womb. You wove me together there and you wrote all my days in a book before there are any of them. So if somebody asked you, how long are you going to live? I know how long I'm going to live. I'm going to live according to the number of days that God wrote in his book before there are any of them when I was born. We sang it today, hey. You have, what does it say? Something from my mother's womb. What's the word? Chosen me, chosen me from my mother's womb. He's chosen you from your mother's womb too. A lot of stuff might happen on the way through, but he's chosen you and he's chosen me and he knows your name and he knows my name and he knows that when Jesus came into our life that we could be the man or the woman and live the life that he purposed for us to live so that it could be effective and impacting upon the lives of others. Praise God for that. I think that's good. I'm happy about that. So Zacchaeus, it says in verse 8 of Luke 19, he says, Lord, I'm giving half of my goods to the poor, and whoever I've cheated, I'll give back four times more. Isn't that marvellous? See, his name that God knew, part of it really meant to do good. He wasn't doing good, but when Jesus changed his life, he started to do the good that was already resonant within him. You know, the things that are resonant in you and I that we don't even know about yet, they're in there, and God by his Spirit is going to draw them out and let them run out and touch the lives of other people. And, uh, man, I wouldn't be dead for quids. Pretty hard to come by these days, but anyway. So anyway, we're a part of a crowd, we're a part of believers and our lives do tell a story. Now we started, um, how are we going? Can you handle about another eight minutes? We started in Genesis 11 with a crowd together wanting to make a difference in the world that was round about them. That's the very starting point. The three aspects of their commitment together, let us make bricks, build all we want, let us build a city, with a tower to reach into heaven and let us make a name for ourselves. God's attention is really drawn to this crowd. And if you want to read on in Genesis 11 there, the, the essence of what he says really grabs me. It says, God said, nothing can stop them from doing all they have purposed to do. Now that was a crowd not under divine direction, and simply under human inspiration. God's word, nothing can stop them from doing all that they have purposed to do. How about if it's a group of people, a crowd, and the Spirit of God's involved, and the life of Christ is involved, and their hearts are towards God to be about his business, so they're spirit-filled, spirit-inspired people, and God looks down on this church, his church, that's going to overcome every work and device of the enemy and says, 
Nothing can stop them from doing all that they've purposed to do. Is that good news or what? Is it possible? Is it taking the scripture wrong? If God started and said that right back in the beginning of the book with an unregenerated lot, and now we come to this place where we're regenerated, born of the Spirit of God, I think God can do anything, and he probably will. So the power that's invested in the crowd, divinely inspired, Holy Spirit empowered, and I'm going to close in Hebrews 10. So again, I'm not going to read the scriptures. I'll just simply say what they say, Hebrews 10. It simply says, I'll read verse 19. So my friends, Jesus by his blood gives us courage to enter the most holy place. He's created for us a new and living way through the curtain that is through his flesh. Since we have a great high priest who presides over the house of God, he says, let us draw near with true hearts full of faith, with hearts rinsed clean of any evil conscience, with bodies cleansed with pure water, born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, baptized in water, risen to walk in a new life as followers of Christ and ambassadors for Christ. Secondly, they say, let us hold strong to the confession of our hope, never wavering with it since the one who promised it to us is faithful. You know, Hebrews 6 simply says, uh, hope is an anchor that keeps your and my soul. Hope. Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans 15, he said, the God of hope will fill your heart with all joy and peace in believing so that you can abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, how good is that? This people just said, let's hold strong to the confession of our hope and the third thing they said was, let us consider how to inspire each other to greater love and to righteous deeds, not forgetting to gather as a community, I'll say of believers, ambassadors for Christ, as some have forgotten, but encouraging each other, especially as the day of his return approaches. How then shall we live? The three let us's of Hebrews 10 is God's blueprint really for an effective people to really impact the world. So as I look at that, I see the crowd position in the church Jesus is building, purpose to overcome the enemy's plans and devices, and preparing the way for our heavenly Father's kingdom to powerfully be manifest right here in the earth. I'm going to finish with one verse of scripture, and it's in Second Peter chapter 3. It says, now the Lord is not slow about enacting his promise. Slow is how some people want to characterize it. No, he's not slow, but patient and merciful to you, not wanting anyone to be destroyed, but wanting everyone to turn away from following his own path and to turn towards God's. God is not slow. You know, you might, this morning even, I've been believing for so long and it hasn't happened. Might be in your family, might be loved ones, really, that you've been believing God for, and it hasn't happened. You know, God's saying this morning, he's not slow at enacting his promise, but he's being merciful to you and to myself, because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to know the truth, as it is in Jesus. And you and I are carriers. Thank God. The carries of the greatest treasure that's ever hit this planet. Can we stand together this morning? Let us, so when you go home, maybe you can reflect a bit on the lettuces. Easy one to remember. The three lettuces of Hebrews 10. But you know, this morning, I'm, I'm always conscious anyway, crowds you know, wherever we're in a crowd, and we may not be a massive crowd, but we are in a crowd that has influence. But maybe there's some amongst us too that your life's been influenced by a crowd in the past negatively, and it's still impacting upon your life, still challenging really how you function and how you think about God's love for you, how you think about God thinking about you can be a challenge. 
Then there's those, really, I said, really, as we read through Hebrews 10 there, filled, born of the Spirit, we're filled with the Spirit, we're baptized in water, really buried to rise in a newness of life to walk in with God. Maybe some haven't come to that place, really, and that's something that just to be filled with the Spirit of God. You know, when Neil, as the pastor, leads us from the front here, and thank God we're expressive about speaking in other tongues, being free to magnify the Lord in that manner. And uh, really, what a wonderful gift that God's given to all of us, really, that we can come before him, not dependent on our ability in the English language, but we can speak out of our spirit mysteries, the Bible says, and communicate directly to God in that whole area. Maybe then it's the crowd, this crowd. We want to be strong, hold strong in our hope. Maybe your hope's been wavering a little bit. Maybe there's a bit of a challenge in that. You want to hold fast to it and press on and overcome and break through. This morning, I'm simply saying those things this morning. If I know there's already been prayer happened here, but if you want prayer, this is, altar is always open. Hey? You never, ever want to just uh, rush up for the cup of tea and coffee and miss a need that you might have. But if you need prayer this morning for anything or you need it for health in your body, difficulties, and just want someone to stand with you in prayer, love to be able to pray with you and believe God with you. And uh, trust that as we go out from here, we're going to carry an influence into this week. Somebody, God can open the door, the pathway that we walk, and the opportunity to share the wonder of Christ with them. How good would that be? And maybe we'll have testimonies happening of Jesus is going home with notorious sinners. That'd be wonderful. Now they're a part of the family of God. Thanks, Musos.